Welcome back to the Martian MMA Podcast. I am your host. My name is John, also known as The Martian, here to talk about this week's UFC card going down this weekend from the UFC Apex headline by Kyle Bohio versus Jared Cannonier in a 12-fight card featuring some Ultimate Fighter finales and several other not-so-good fights. Um, just a pretty rough card. Top to bottom, I've talked about it before, but the, the UFC has three tiers of card. This is certainly a C-tier card, and that is just blatantly obvious. Just a rough week of fights, but I think there's some interesting betting angles. I'm obviously going to do um, my best to try to unravel some profitable ventures in these fights. Um, and we're going to talk about them all in one second here, but we're coming off of a great week last week. Um, it was a, a, a big, much-needed bounce-back week uh, for me in terms of, of bets and predictions. And, uh, you know, obviously a mix of right and wrong about certain things, but uh, definitely think that the rights outweighed the wrongs. And, uh, you know, I wasn't – I'll start with what I was wrong about the over in the uh, Aguilar and Nico, Nico fight. Um, Josh Cooley bow. Uh, I sort of doubted Protest's knockout ability over Jing Liang, but we saw that that was no problem and didn't have too good of a prediction, I would say, in the Komi in the main event. But um, uh, Song Kanong was good. Casey O'Neill was good. Walter Walker was good. Um, the Rosenstrike fight and the Hooker fights, I think I predicted those very well, uh, especially the Dan Hooker fight, the, you know, the Hooker uh, money line, the fight going the distance, the Hooker decision, the split decision. I mean, I think... I really predicted that fight well, and that was a very, very profitable fight with a plus 300 underdog winning the underdog Walter Walker cash in an easy fashion. Um, and then I also shouted out the over in the Carlos Protez fight um, that, that was able to cast the over significant strikes in the Protez fight. Um, so I just think it was a pretty a solid week of, of predictions for me, definitely very profitable. And uh, mostly thanks to our boy Ricardo Hamos now, uh, an official boy of mine who was a absolutely man massive underdog in the entire portion of that fight despite it being very close and that happened to squeak out a split decision in the very end uh that was huge and i just enjoyed the card uh, top to bottom as well ddp is he continues to be an enigma i continue to predict his fight wrongs uh that guy is just a fucking animal he's a juggernaut he's a junkyard dog he is whatever acronym or you know nickname you want to give him um but that guy is a, a bad motherfucker and i can't wait to c continue to see him fight um and that's enough about last week though we are going to get into the first fight on this week's card, which is in the women's flyweight division between Kong Wang and Victoria Leonardo. Odds for this one have Wang at minus 1,200 to Leonardo at plus 800. So, I mean, if this is a Chinese woman with five MMA fights, and, uh, you know, it's worth noting that she's Chinese because the strength of, of the competition over there, not very high. Um, so, you know, if you're watching the tape on this woman, you're thinking, hey, man, is she going to be 90%? You would think she, she's some unstoppable juggernaut who is skilled on the ground and on the feet and has been beating opponents easily and finishing them. Not really the case at all. I mean, I don't, I, I think that she's solid on, on the mat and on the feet um, and could be potentially promising, but nothing I've seen from her in MMA would suggest to me, oh, she's over over 90% to win a fight. She beat the, the veteran Wu Yanan. She got a finish on the road to UFC against a total bum opponent, but I just haven't seen anything in these fights that really impressed me. And I, I certainly think she's getting some sort of bump from the fact that she beat Shevchenko in kickboxing 10 years ago. So she comes from a kickboxing background, but I mean, five MMA fights, um, Leonardo is not good, right? She's very flawed in all areas of, of MMA, but she's she's tough and she's experienced. Three times experience. She's fought in LFA, Invicta, the UFC, fought really, really good competition in the UFC. The three women she's lost to are all skilled women, you know, top five, top 10, top 15 women in Fierro Gatto Silva. Fierro is probably the best damn uh, flyweight in the UFC. So I just don't understand where people are getting 90% confidence from Wang in. Um, so a small bet on Leonardo is warranted. Uh, you know, it's just a roll of the dice and uh, <laughs> women's MMA has, has done a lot crazier things than this woman shit in the bed in her UFC debut. So I, I, I think this line is insane. I don't understand where this confidence in, in Wang is coming from. And, uh, yeah, that, that'll do it for that fight. We're moving on. 
to a featherweight fight um, in some with some newcomers here. I haven't even began to think about how to pronounce this guy's name. Um, Zygamantis Ramuska taking on uh, Nathan Fletcher. I'm going to call him Ram. I'm going to call him the, the Lithuanian guy. His name is Ram. Taking on Nathan Fletcher. Fletcher is minus 150. Ram is plus 130. To be honest, don't have a really strong read on this one. I've watched a few of these guys' fights, but don't really have a, a confident uh, read here. Um, Fletcher, most of his wins have come by submission. Although on the contenders, or the tough, he got you know destroyed on the mat and taken down and stuck on bottom for long, long periods of time. And most of the guys he's beating um, are just, you know, regional tier guys over in Cage Warriors. And we know those guys all suck at grappling. So uh, I have some questions about that. But it definitely seems like Nathan should have the grappling advantage here. Um, and we've seen some pretty bad things from Ram on his back. But I think Ram should be the much better striker. And he's had um, some crazy wild fights on, on the feed. His contender, his tough fight was really good. He got dropped and hurt early there and came back and, you know, just was uh, just a, a juggernaut coming forward with high aggression and volume there. So. So when it's on the feet, I think it should favor the Lithuanian and Ram. And when it's on the ground, I think it should flavor Fletcher. But I, I don't have enough of a confident read to stamp this one. I would lean towards dog or pass. Um, but the the under in this fight is also set at one and a half rounds. And it's favored to go under. I think that I would be looking to play that to go over, to be honest, um, if anything. But I'm not going to stamp anything official here because I just don't have a good enough read on this one. Um, so we'll just sit back and watch that one, gather intel, look for live bets, and we're moving on. Another fight in the women's uh, bantamweight division this time, jo Josiah Josie, uh, whatever, Nunez taking on Jacqueline Calvacanti. Odds for this one, Calvacanti minus 225, Nunez plus 190. This is the fight I looked into the least on the, on the card. And uh, Nunez just lost to Chelsea Chandler. And any woman who just lost to Chelsea Chandler, I don't really have much faith in. Calvacanti's UFC debut wasn't uh, really impressive either versus uh, Zara Farron. Um, she kind of just um, buzzsawed her way through there with a lot of volume and um I think she had some takedowns as well. I don't know. I, I'm not going to waste your guys' time on this fight. I have no bets here. Uh, I guess Calvacanti will win by decision. Who the fuck knows? Um, oh, she landed 126 strikes versus Farron. Impressive. Riveting. Um, anyway, we're moving on. Um, much better fights to bet on the card than that one. And we are in the lightweight division. Vlacheslav Borishev, James Lontop. Um, odds for this one, Slava Claus. Minus 205, Lontop plus 175. Um, I think Lontop is a bum, to be honest. And, uh, you know, I, I've been very critical of, of Slava in his career as well. But the guy's offense on the feet is good. And, um, you know, we did see him get dropped by... Um, chase super in the last fight but i think that that was kind of a first minute first minute chin thing uh which is a a patent and trademark uh phrase by the legendary mma better gugabe um but for the yeah, first minute chin there for for uh borshev and i think he uh I think he's just much more experienced and skilled on the feet than Lon Top. Um, both these guys are, are bad grapplers. You know, Slava's lost most of his fights due to grappling. Don't think that that should be much of a factor here. Um, and Lon Top is also, uh, I believe, he's, is he driving down in weight? No, I think he's just looking a lot better. Um, he's been training much more intently. He, he does train at, uh, at Intram Gym, which is a absolute powerhouse gym. Uh, with a lot of Mexican and Hispanic fighters, where well, they have great steroid regimen down there, so that's something to consider. But I don't know. I think it should play out on the feet. I trust with Slava's experience a little bit more. Not gonna bet anything on this one, but I do think that Slava is not gonna have a lot, a lot of trouble here. Um, and and Lontop's ground game just looked horrible in that last fight versus Padilla. Just a pathetic all around uh, effort from him in that fight. Um, so. Yeah, no, no bets here again. We're, we're gonna we're gonna get into some bets here eventually. I swear, I swear. But we're starting things off with uh with not too many interesting fights, and the trend continues in the next fight. Premier Division, Jose Medina taking on Zach Reese. Um, maybe Medina's the guy who trains at Entram. No, he doesn't. <laughs> um, but Medina, how the fuck did this guy get in the UFC? How the fuck did this guy get into the UFC? I mean, his pre, his pre-contender series fight sucked. He got dominated in the contender series. I don't know what about 
uh, this guy, Dana Light. I don't, I didn't refresh my memory with Dana White's fucking post contender series speech about why he signed this guy, but Medina is a total bum. Um, and Zach Reese is, uh, likely also a total bum but he definitely has some finishing uh, power he he tends to just run out opponents and finish them quickly all of his wins have come in the first round never been out of the first round in his entire pro career so that's got to be a concern and that alone makes him unbettable at minus 600 but I really don't even think Medina is worth a stab at 400, man. I think this guy is either going to be finished early or put in a lot of trouble early on to the point where you could probably live bet Medina if he's still active and, you know, awake after a few minutes. But I wouldn't be surprised for, for Reese to just continue the, the early finish train here and roll through Medina. Um, and that's what I'll, I'll pick him to do. I have no opinion on whether it's sub or, or, or KO. I'll go with, with KO as, as the official prediction. Um, all right, now we're going to get into some more interesting fights. Featherweight division, Dennis Bazookia taking on Francis Marshall. Odds for this one have Marshall minus 140, Bazookia plus 120. New Jersey versus New York here. This is a good one. Bazookia, full camp, was supposed to fight Danny Silva, fighting Francis Marshall, who's filling in on less than a week's notice. I think it's a, a good thing for Bazookia, man. He's, he's getting, I think, a much easier opponent, um, a, a guy with a similar level of experience. This is kind of a, just a, a glorified CFFC fight. Uh, Marshall's struggling big time lately, um, had that underwhelming loss to Gomis, and then just got absolutely destroyed by Dolgarian. And... Um, I'm going with Bazooka here. I believe that I, I think I see a little bit more promise in his overall skill set. Um, he's the one preparing for a full camp. I trust the gym he trains at better. You're going to hear people say that Francis has been training at ATT the past few months, and he has been, but uh, I don't think he's fully committed to doing so. And, you know, ATT has so many fighters, so many high level fighters. I don't think this guy is getting much like specialized attention down at ATT. I don't, I, he's probably just spent the first few months just getting, you know, beat up by all the better fighters there, which is good because that's something that, that's going to progress his career long term. But I don't think a few months worth of it is going to do much, especially the fact that he wasn't even in full camp. And now he's taking this fight on five days notice. It's his, uh, I believe it's his fourth UFC fight. What, yeah, it is. Fourth UFC fight, which is interesting because this is quite the gamble. If he loses this fight, he's one and three in the UFC and he might not get signed again. So this is a, a big fight for Francis. You know, he must be confident in himself to, to, to gamble on this opportunity. But um, yeah, I don't know. I'm going bazooka here. I, I trust him a little bit more. I thought we saw good solid improvements in his last fight versus Matthews. Um, you know, he was able to finish Matthews and uh, and Marshall wasn't. So um, last fight on the prelims, but I'm going with Bazooka here plus money. Interesting to see that that the guy coming in on five days notice is the favorite. Um, I think Bazooka is being a little disrespected here. And I'm going with New York to win the fight at plus money. Main card time, six fight main card. We got two fights uh, crowning the winners of the contenders. And... Um, just a thrown together main card here. I mean, this Bohio and, and Cannoneer fight wasn't even put together until like two weeks ago. So starting things off, another fight in the Premier Division. That's a good sign. Shabazian versus Mearshart. We have Shabazian minus 305 coming back with Mearshart at plus 255. Uh, you know, I definitely skew towards Mearshart being the side here. Um, we all know how Mearshart fight goes on the feed. He's, he's so slow and hittable these days. He's kind of a sitting duck. But he's, he's tough. He's... he's crafty he knows how to get the fight on the floor he's he's been he's got his ass kicked a dozen times and come back to win a dozen times in the ufc alone so um the fact that shabazian is kind of a, a quitter he, he collapses as the fight goes on definitely leads you to believe that this fight if it gets out of the first round should probably favor mearshart um but then it becomes the question of is it better to to wait to live bet mearshart or is it better to take him before the fight and that is a fight that that is a question that I don't exactly have a definitive answer to, but um, I would lean before I would lean before the fight is fine. I mean, obviously, the fact that Shabazian finishing in the first round is is built into the equity of this line at minus 300. And I just think it's going to get really hairy if it hits the mat at any point or if it gets out of the first round. Um, so. I think I would say go small before the fight on Mearshart and then be ready to add more 
uh, once the fight plays out and once you're seeing how it goes. Um, because very, very good chance that Mearshart eats some big strikes here. Might even get knocked out pretty quickly. And it might look like uh, Shabazi in minus 300 was, was perfectly fine. But historically, considering how how often Shabazian has collapsed um, against much better fighters than Mearshart, let's give him a little bit of credit. You know, um, Brunson, Hermanson, Imavov, Hernandez, all those guys are really solid fighters. Um, and he typically has passed this kind of uh, this kind of tier of test. Um, but I'm going. Uh, yeah, I, I'll I'll have some faith in GM three. Don't bet GM three subline. It's only plus you know six hundred while his money line is almost at three hundred. So um, small roll of the dice on Mearshart. Be ready to add later. And then uh, what is Mearshart in the second round? Uh, plus a thousand and the third twelve hundred. Those aren't really great odds, honestly, for a plus two fifty underdog. So. Um, yeah, go go GM three though. Much much cooler guy. Been uh, been a profitable guy. If you uh, have been around the MMA betting sphere for a while. Speaking of a profitable guy for the MMA betting sphere as an underdog, we have possibly the most perennial underdog of the past few years. Neil Magny in the next fight taking on Michael Morales in the welterweight division. Morales is minus eight fifty. Magny plus six hundred. Man, Neil Magny. This guy, you got to fucking admire him because. He's had a fairly lackluster past few years, but he just fights so many good fighters. Like any time there's like a good fighter coming up at 170, they feed him to Neil Magny and see how he does. And um, usually he gives those guys a good test. And um, I think he'll he'll give a good test to Morales here. I think this is a, a solid step up for, for Morales. Um, I don't think it's... Uh, I think like Griffin and Matthews are, are were solid guys around the same tier as Magny, but you know Magny has a mythical way of dragging fights into competitive areas where he gets the fight in a clinch and he wears on you. And um, you know I don't think that Magny is just going to get completely outboxed here and shut out to you know uh, either a finish or thirty twenty seven. I don't think Michael Morales is going to look ninety percent here. I think. His line's gotten a little out of hand. I think minus three to four hundred would probably be fine for for Morales. But even in his recent fights against Griffin and against um, Matthews, those were competitive fights. There were competitive striking exchanges, especially the Matthews fight. I mean, it might sound crazy to some people, but I remember people scoring that fight for Jake Matthews, um, which. And it doesn't seem that outlandish to me. I, I was a very competitive uh, boxing fight between the two of them, and. Uh, yeah, I mean, I don't think it's that far fetched to, to to think that Jake Matthews actually possibly won two out of three rounds there. Um, the Griffin fight, I believe it was close for a round, the first round, but then he but then he pulled away. So I don't know. I'm just not quite proven enough on Morales to say that he deserves ninety percent. We've seen much better fighters than Neil than Michael Morales fight Neil Magny and struggle. Um, so. Yeah, I would maybe be looking to play the fight to go to go long in addition to maybe a stab on Magni money line. The fight is favored to go the distance, so uh Yeah, I believe, I believe the the GTD at minus 150, I believe would be would a good way to play the fight. Um you're kind of uh doubting Morales's knockout ability, which is fine. Um and uh you know, you know Magni, I think if he's winning the fight or at all, it's going to be by decision, so that covers a good amount of his equity as well. So, the GTD minus 150, I think that's solid and um can't knock a stab on Magni at 6 to 1 uh either. So, um good fight there. They're they're giving Michael the the Magni litmus test. I think it's a good time in his career for it and I'm interested to see how how he it plays out. Um so we are moving on to the featherweight division. Uh, Khan Ofley taking on Marion Santos. Odds for this one. Santos is the favorite, minus 191. Ofley plus 166. Initially, I was thinking Ofley would be the side here, but I kind of think where the line is at now is accurate. Santos is one contender. Or his one, I keep fucking saying contenders. I might just stick with it. You guys know what the fuck I'm talking about. His one fight on tough um, against uh, Cooper, I think his name was. Uh, Cooper Jr. Cooper Sharp Jr. Um he looked bad. I mean, he, he got taken down and stuck on bottom for large portions. I actually thought he lost that fight. So, uh, and I was, and then Ofley does like to grapple. He does like to hit takedowns in his fight. So I was thinking, oh, Ofley should win the fight. But I think on the feet, Ofley is not going to have much success here. He's the smaller guy. He fights at 135. Um, and he, he, he has moved up to uh, to featherweight here just for this, uh, opportunity. actually, you know what? I'm mistaken. He has fought a featherweight a lot in his career. 
I was thinking of a, a different fighter for some reason. I don't know who the fuck I was thinking of. Um, but um, Ofli is likely going to need takedowns to win this fight. While I think Santos should control the distance striking of the feed, he does seem like the much sharper striker. He's going to have some size on Ofli. And he might get taken down here, but I don't think Ofli is very dangerous on the mat. I don't think he's going to, you know massively control santos or put him in a imminent finishing threat so i think santos could get taken down here a few times and still work his way back up to the feet land the better strikes win a decision here so um i think the line where it's at is accurate you know um again these are tough guys uh inexperienced guys um so i'm not really i don't really have a definitive read on these guys so i would tread lightly on all all three of these these t tough fights i would tread lightly although the next one i think is the most confident one i'm in so we're going to move on to that fight premier division again ryan loader robert valentin odds for this one valentin as the favorite minus 155 loader plus 135 so i did i did most of my foot uh, i did the most amount of tape study on this fight out of the three tough fights. And um, I think Loader is going to be the side here plus money. You know, he comes from a wrestling background. He's certainly looking to get the fight on the floor. His striking isn't good, but it seems like he he knows his limits. You know, he he's not throwing a lot of strikes. He's not engaging in the pocket a lot. He's being very cautious on the feet. And that's what he wants to do here because Valentin, um, he's a big swinging fighter. He, he, has that nasty knockout on the contender series with the elbow um but uh his grappling looks bad it really does look bad he he even got uh hurt with some strikes in that his most recent fight i don't even know the guy's name but he was actually losing the striking in that fight and then he hit a head and arm throw and got a a, a case of katami um arm lock there which is embarrassing to get caught with an mma absolutely embarrassing the tough the tough competition was fucking horrible i mean loader at one of his fights he takes down some canadian guy who looks like he's never been on bottom before and he just gives up the arm triangle as clear as day and he gets tapped that i mean th just a horrible horrible tough season um Alexa Grasso's dumbass, completely incapable of coaching people. I watched the one loader fight. Uh, the guy gets taken down. She goes, "Get up, get up, get up." Um, yeah, I think he fucking knows he needs to get up. And the, what what good advice is yelling "Get up, get up, get up" at a guy who just got taken down, and then he gets submitted sixty seconds later. Um, but getting back to the fight here, uh, Valentin certainly seems like he has the more, uh, striking, uh, upside here. I believe he's the harder hitter of the two, but I don't think this guy's striking is any good. I don't think he has any process. It's not like his boxing is crisp and not like he has a lot of go-to strikes. He's looking to just swing and take your head off while, um, loader should be looking to not engage on the feet, look to hit the takedown. And Valentin has shown a bad game on the bottom. He's gotten out grappled to lose several of his fights. And uh, the most concerning one was the Salomov fight just two years ago. Salomov is a good fighter who's been racking up wins over an Aries over solid competition. But Valentin taken down easily, stuck on bottom, gets passed, gets mounted, uh, gets put in a deep arm triangle submission. So it seems like if Loder is able to get him flat on the back, he should um, control the fight and win it. The reason why Loader is not like a favorite here, I think, is because I don't think Loader's um, MMA wrestling and MMA grappling is really too strong. There are a few of his fights over in the Uriah Faber promotion where he struggles to get opponents down or he gets the opponents down and they get back up to their feet. I don't think he really has a skilled MMA top game and wrestling game. Um, but the fact that he is a wrestler and he should be attempting takedowns here, he should be attempting to exploit the, the easiest path to victory to beat Valentin does make him uh, a good underdog. In my opinion, I think this fight should probably be, you know, 50, 50, maybe even loader as the favorite, because I just think that if the fight goes longer and we see, you know, more a more uh, definitive result out of these two i think it should be loader winning the fight uh with his wrestling so um i'll, I'll be i have bet loader plus 145 i think he's a solid dog there moving on co-main event strawway division tabitha ricci taking on angie hill minus 125 for ricci plus 105 for hill um 
been a historic fan of Angie Hill. You know, she's not only one of the best fighters. I'll say it every time. Every time. She's not only one of the best fighters in women's MMA history. She's also the sexiest woman in, in MMA history. And if you hear anybody saying like, oh, Tabitha Ricci's hot. Oh, she was a fat ass or something. Bro, fuck that guy. And just take a look at, at just the sex symbol that is Angie Hill. And not only that, she can fight. She's just an incredibly amazing fighter. Don't let the fact that she lost 13 times in MMA fool you don't let the fact that she is 12 and 13 in the ufc fool you she is truly one of the best fighters that women's mma has ever seen so getting down to the fight uh i mean richie is 10 years younger in mma in women's mma especially but when you're talking about a fight um this fight is minus 500 to go to the decision um we're, we're probably going to see a 15 minute competitive fight between the two of them and one woman is 10 years younger i mean it's kind of a simple dumb way to look at the fight but i i think it's probably fine to to just pick richie based on youth also richie has very good luck with the, the judges um, she's had some strokes of luck go her way. Like the one fight, uh, the loopy fight, I thought she probably lost that one like 30, 27. And then a judge scored it for, her, which, you know, didn't make a ton of sense to me. Um, the, the, the Tisha fight as well. Tisha Torres. Most people thought that Tisha won that one and Ricci got that, even though she landed 26 significant strikes less than, than Tisha. She somehow got that decision. So, uh, Ricci has a little bit of mythical decision powers while Angie Hill been robbed on the scorecard several times throughout her career. Um, Limos, uh, Waterson, Gedalia. It's happened. It hasn't happened in a while. Uh, but, um, she's had historically horrible luck with that. Um, so, and also, if anybody's ending up on top here, I think it should probably be Ricci. Ricci more likely to attempt takedowns and more likely to to hit them as well. So, um, on the feet, honestly, Angela is the better striker of the two. She's more crafty. She has more experience, way more um, time on the feet. And I think just think her technique at distance and in the clinch is overall better. But Ricci, uh, um, I think will will find a way to win the fight. I think she is pretty crafty, and she's also pretty experienced in her own right. She's been very active since getting in the UFC has fought a decent um, realm of competition from bad fighters to good fighters you know she shut out Jillian Robertson in a, in a dominant win there uh, which I, I consider pretty impressive so um, I'll be going I'll be going with Ricci to win the fight unfortunately by decision the fight is like I said minus 500 to hit the cards it should be competitive the odds for the fight to end and split decision are plus 225 which is the narrowest I've ever seen those split decision odds but still I mean, both these women have a ton of split decisions, and it should be competitive. Only way it's not competitive is if um, Ricci gets on top for like two out of three or three rounds. Um, but if it's on the feet, if it's in the clinch, man, that shit's going to be really, really competitive, and the rounds are probably going to be toss up. So um, I'd say Ricci or pass at current prices, honestly. So um, moving on to the main event in the premier division and this is actually the fourth premier division fight on the card which is a very promising sign and it's a premier division apex main event which those fights have historically um, been amazing absolutely terrific no one's ever had a bad thing to say about the apex middleweight main events and we're keeping up the trend here kyle bohio taking on jared cannoneer the odds for this one have Kayo as the minus 240 favorite coming back, Jared Cannonier plus 205. So this fight was thrown together pretty recently. I think it was just only two or three weeks ago this fight was announced. So you have Cannonier, um, who's coming off of that quick early stoppage to uh, Imavolve. That was only 10 weeks ago. So pretty quick turnaround for Cannonier here. Fighting in a main event again. He's had a ton of main events in the UFC. I, I would say probably close to eight by now or something if I had to guess. Kyle Ohio first time scheduled for five rounds in the UFC, but he's actually fought the full five rounds before in a regional promotion back in 2020. Um, Vildemar Santos, um, he won that fight in, in a five round fight going the full 25. So it's good to know that he has some ability and experience in going the full 25 minutes. But this is his toughest test to date, man. And it's toughest test in a long, long time. I think his UFC matchmaking has actually been really soft and favorable for him. Um, I mean, there's like five guys 
who he's beaten, five or six guys who he's beaten, who are just flat out bad grapplers, just not really great fighters overall. Um, over Omar Gadjev, Petrosian, Ola Chayshuk, those guys are straight up horrible on the mat. Muradov uh, and Magomedov are not very good. They're very beatable. And then Craig is just a very beatable fighter overall. Who He didn't even need to take that fight to the mat. Just outstruck him on the feet, knocked him out on the feet. And I think this is just going to be Kyle's toughest test to date in terms of uh, a striker and a guy to get down. I mean, Cannoneer, great striker, great boxer, hard leg kicker, and just had solid takedown defense throughout his entire career. And, um, you know, you'd have to go back a long time to uh, point to a fight where Cannoneer lost the fight due to being out grappled. It would probably be the Jan Blahovic fight. Um, seven years ago at 205 but really at 185 he i don't think he's ever been out grappled so um he's just a tough guy to get down and uh, you got to wonder you know if this fight gets stuck on the feet and bohio isn't able to get the takedowns how is the striking going to look i imagine it would favor jared cannonier even though he's 40 years old even though in his last fight we saw him show a little bit of uh, you know mortality i guess you could say he looked his age a little in that last fight he didn't have quite as good cardio he got hurt with some shots a little bit um a little bit easier than we've seen him in the past but Still, I think the striking gap between these guys is is, is a pretty good margin. Kai is not a bad striker. I mean, for a guy who's a predominant grappler, his striking is solid. He's got good kicks, fast hands from the southpaw stance. And I don't think it's going to be a blowout for Cannoneer. But I think if we're seeing like entire rounds play out on the feet, I think it should be Jared Cannoneer getting the better of it. I don't think that's very far-fetched to say. So... You got to wonder how how urgently is Kyle going to pursue those takedowns and how are those takedowns going to fare against a guy with solid takedown defense in Jared Cannonier? And they might work and he might get him down a few times, might win some rounds with the takedowns. But for a line to be minus 240, 70% for Bohio, that shows some pretty, pretty strong confidence in him getting those takedowns and him being able to um, take on this tall task of fighting in his first UFC main event fighting a good opponent in Cannoneer. And I think this fight is actually, um, it has much higher stakes for Bohio because he's 16-1, and one, right? He hasn't lost since 2015. He's undefeated in the UFC. He's been running through everybody. Meanwhile, Cannoneer, I think he's kind of getting... Um, He's kind of getting a break because he just fought 10, month, uh, 10 weeks ago. He had that tough loss. Now he's getting another main event spot. He's getting a good, a good high-ranked up-and-coming fighter. And he has a chance to get back on track here um, after that last loss, which I'm sure left a terrible taste in his mouth. And, and considering that he did get rocked in that fight and finished, um, he's not fighting a hard puncher in Kyo here. So that's a little bit of a break for him as well. So I think just most things point to, to Cannoneer being the side here of plus money. Um, I don't really have a, a clear idea of how the fight is going to play out, but I think that um, Plus 200, I think, is solid for Cannoneer, who um, I believe is the better striker, better boxer, has hard leg kicks, and is could could potentially chop down the legs of Kai and make those takedowns harder to get. Solid takedown defense, a ton of five-round experience, a lot of experience in the apex going the five rounds as well. And, um, yeah, I think I think things are looking solid here for Cannoneer. I think this is a good opportunity for him. So plus 200, I believe, is a good spot for, for Cannoneer. And, uh, you know, just me waiting on the live line here. Look how Cannoneer is dealing with the takedowns. Look to add more if he's fighting well. And um, that is going to do it. This week is a weird week of fights, man. I think everyone should be pretty, you know, cautious and have some trepidation about these fights because three of the fights are um, completely new UFC fighters right um, just the tough guys coming in uh, Kong Wang making her debut uh, Calvin Canty has one UFC fight Reese has two fights Medina his UFC debut so you have a lot of younger more high variance fighters you also have a few massive underdogs right uh, Leonardo's plus 800 Medina's plus 425 Magny's plus 600 and then you have short notice fights you have uh Marshall filling in for Danny Silva the main event was only put together two or three weeks ago um, and then there's also uh, three women's fights in the card so I just think this week is a good week to be very light with with bets and I believe that that is something I've re reflected in my analysis not really a lot of bets that I that I'm stamping the bet the money line bets I I, I firmly like are Cannoneer money line Bazookia money line and Ryan Loader money line. 
And then I like some stabs on some underdogs here um, with Leonardo at plus 800. Um, Mirror Shark 250, Magni 600. I think those are so solid stabs. Uh, but, you know, you're going to want to be light and, and, and cautious with, with those guys. And uh, I also think there's also a few bets like uh, I I like, but um haven't placed yet. Uh, Ricci money line I think is, is solid at minus 118. And uh, the, the goes the distance in the Magni Morales fight, I think, uh, could be good. And, uh, yeah, so that, that that's a kind of a summary of my thoughts. That'll do it for me this week. We are off the UFC next week. We're going to be back in two weeks back in the Apex with Burns versus Brady. Then we have a big September ahead of us. We have the, the Sphere pay-per-view. We're going back to Paris with a great card there. So uh, it's going to be a fun September. And, uh, looking forward to that so thank you all for tuning in hope you all enjoy the fights win some bets this weekend and i will see you all before the next ufc event in two weeks peace out everyone